All right. Thank you for listening to another episode of Remake Rewind, the podcast where we decide if remakes or reboots should have happened. And this week we get political. I'm Mike, as always. I've got my my buddy, Alex. What's up, bud? Hey, man. I'm, I'm Alex, also, as always. I usually am, and get I still am. Get out of the am. kitchen! Please leave that in. I'm for a female cat. I think it's just a cat. Oh, I think it's just cat and tomcat. But that's like... That's lame. I, I, I Why do agree, female dogs get a special you. word? I don't know, dude. I don't know. It's garbage. Know. It is garbage. That's um, speciest. I, I raised my office chair just a little bit, and my both of my cats like sitting there. And um, now one of them, I'm assuming both, but only one's noticed, and she can't get up there. There's like not enough room. <laughs> so she keeps on going up to it and being like, hey, what's the deal? Why can't I get up here? That's pretty funny. Yeah. And I'm like, we're hey, getting I, ready to I don't want you to move. sit up anyway. We got a we've. We got our keys to our new apartment today. Our lease technically starts in a week, but they they gave That's us awesome. the keys early. So our Congrats, cats are buddy. gonna. Oh, thanks, man. Our cats are gonna love that exploring a two story, little townhouse apartment that we got. So yeah, that's cats awesome. will definitely adjust to that. Where is it again? What's the address? It's in. Well, I'm not gonna give the address on air, but it, <laughs> damn it, I'll get them one of these days. <laughs> my social is that, security is my guys, address is my mother's maiden name. Are you guys closer to Hollywood now? We're like four minutes away from our current place. I mean, geographically, yes, we are technically closer to Hollywood. But, but it's about the same. It's about the same. That's cool. Yeah. We yeah. can uh, yeah, we yeah, can yeah. drive over to each other's places and rub our faces on each other and yeah. just sneeze into Dude, each other's we're mouths. We're going to have a, um, an office set up in the new pad, pad and it's going to be my work, you know, work from home office slash podcast recording studio. So when uh, yeah, that's the pandemic's lifted, like you'll be able to come over, you'll have a special chair and we'll be actually able to record like we're professionals yeah and that might actually happen sooner now that uh joseph biden has been elected our 46th president living in america <laughs> yeah god how great was it this weekend going oh, through west man. hollywood yeah so mike and i um through no coordination whatsoever didn't see each other but ended up driving down the same street just to take in the uh the celebration and if you're not in a major city, I think most of the major cities were the same, but there were just people partying in the streets for all of Saturday. And people it was hanging fantastic. out of their cars, driving down Santa Monica Boulevard. We stayed in our cars, but there are plenty of people not in their cars. Yeah. No, which we, is a different, we went different conversation, but and, it was nice. Oh my God. It was great. Just seeing everybody waving their flags again. Like, I it's, feel like the American flag is going to be for the people again. <laughs> There's a specific breed of joy that I realized that I hadn't felt in four years. I, it, it's just really amazing. Like this last week, how things have shifted, like getting, we, we actually negotiated the rent on our apartment. Like it was more than we wanted to spend and we got them to come down a couple hundred bucks and then getting approved. And then uh, I had some good stuff happen at work and then getting like the election just going through and seeing state by state flip Mandalorian episode on Friday and then get the, the uh, election called on Saturday was just fantastic. And seeing all these people happy and cheering on YouTube and Facebook and just on the news to seeing people cheering all across the country and then driving through West Hollywood and just seeing thousands of people cheering and happy and driving around. Like it's just, I haven't felt hope, in, in especially this year, but I think you're right. For the last four years, it's been really hard to find joy in the world, and I think we're turning a corner. That being said, like we're not done. Like The work isn't done. I think Biden had a really great speech on Saturday night mm -hmm. talking about what he wants to do, and he brought up uh, racial inequality. Uh, he brought up bring, taking care of all the DACA and the Dreamers, and we need to hold him to it. So. I'm not done paying attention to politics. I'm hoping a lot For of sure. people who who were kind of like, oh, B Biden won, we can switch off like, and put everything's back on the rails. Like Getting back on rails isn't good enough. We still need to fix what's broken and yeah. make sure we never have an issue like we've had the last four years. <laughs> uh, we we kind of held it, off. Like I mean... It feels like, nice to breathe for, uh, for the first time it in does. four years. It feels, it feels nice knowing that there's somebody who's going to listen to people. It seems like Biden's going to be somebody who delegates things to people who know what they're doing. It yeah. sounds like he's going to listen. It's not, he's even over the last two months, he's gotten a lot more progressive. So I'm optimistic, but I'm going to be paying attention still. I'm just and, glad to have an adult in the room. 
Exactly. And Someone that we, we can were, have a conversation with. We To start transitioning back into our actual podcast, talking about movies that have been remade, uh, Alex and I were like on the fence all week. We hadn't really decided what we were going to do, whether we were going to do a topic episode or if we wanted to do what we ended up doing. We decided to do The Manchurian Candidate, but we didn't want to do The Manchurian Candidate if we were feeling bummed about politics. So <laughs> we kind of w- waited until Friday when it looked like things were going to be good. And they're like, okay, I guess we'll, we're going to do it. We'll, we'll do something for the election. We'll do the political movie. We'll do Manchurian Candidate. So that's what we did, 1962 and uh, 2004. And, and I'll say, I was watching the first movie at least, um, and I was feeling like, ugh. Part of me was like, man, I regret suggesting doing a political thing. And it it evaporated immediately because I realized I don't feel the same way I did a week ago. Like I'm not as weighed down. There's there's been a weight lifted off my shoulders, and it's like like not even. I'm a little taller. Like my spine is in alignment. Yeah. (laughs) No, it feels good. The air's a little cleaner. Yeah. No, everything just feels like there's hope. Like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Um, we've still got work to do. We we've still got to go through the tunnel, but like there's hope. Yeah. So. I, I'm ready to, to talk about these movies. Have you seen either of these before? So I, I've i seen the, the remake. I remember seeing that, I guess, when it came out, uh, which has been 16 years now. I didn't remember anything came out about when it. I was at the movie theater. Yeah. Still. I feel like the, every movie that we watch, has, it came out when you were at the movie theater. <laughs> um, I feel like I might have seen the original in film school. So like six years ago or something. Um, oh, okay. But again, I don't really remember anything about it. I uh, so love it's fun to Frank Sinatra this. music. I, I hate don't Frank give a Sinatra f- as an actor. I don't give a fuck about Frank Sinatra one way or the other. I I did not know he was in this movie until I rented it and then I saw it on um, the thumbnail. I was like, "Son of a bitch, this is going to be terrible." <laughs> he was fine. I just don't. I don't have any. Um, I think a lot of people who are older grew up with uh, Frank Sinatra. Um, will watch this and have like the nostalgia and be like more forgiving. And I didn't have any of that. I don't care. I, I like his music, but I haven't liked any of the movies I've seen him in. So I saw him in now this, I've of course seen the original oceans 11. We covered that on the podcast and I can't remember the other movie I saw. It was like a, like a modern retelling, I think of, of like Robin hood. Mm. And that was terrible. I, I don't like Frank Sinatra as an actor. So when I saw this, I was like, I don't, want to like this and i'm gonna i'm just gonna be i'm not gonna bash for the movie but i'm just gonna say up front i didn't care for this movie but there were two things right up the top that i want to just give kudos to the film yeah so the first one is there's a fight scene and the fight scene problematic because it's supposed to be you know frank sinatra's playing a guy named ben marco uh and he's fighting a korean guy who's just a dark-haired white guy (laughs) and (laughs) But the fight itself for 1962 is like pretty visceral. It's like getting thrown around a hotel room. You're seeing furniture breaking. You actually see blood on on Frank Sinatra's mouth. You see him get like a little cut on his eye. His suit tears. Like I was pretty impressed with that fight. Like it actually almost kind of reminded yeah. me of that bathroom fight in Casino Royale with uh, Daniel Craig. I don't know why, but that just those images kind of flashed in my mind. Yeah, I didn't really care for the. Um... The guy playing the Korean guy, his name is Henry Silva, by the way. Yeah, it's super weird. And Silva's then, not a traditional Korean name. No, um, it's not. I I know what you're talking about with the fight scene. I didn't I didn't care for it necessarily. I felt I felt like the, uh, some of the editing was um, jarring, but I think that was the point. And I think it yeah. could have been done better, but it's also like 1962, and I appreciate that they were just doing it in a way that was supposed to be jarring and visceral. I think visceral. It, it worked for that I, sense, yeah, but it I didn't really exactly age very right. well. I, I agree. I was just surprised to Which see Which is a not fight. really a fair thing to hold against them, really. Yeah. I, I just was surprised to see a fight like that in the 1960s. Like You started seeing more of that stuff in like the later 70s, early 80s. Um, mm-hmm. Not I, I, I hadn't seen anything like that. Like We brought up the fight in... Uh, 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 the House of Wax, yeah, which was, was two about. like old guys like fighting around. But I thought this was a better fight. You know, I, I really liked the attention of detail, like seeing the suit being torn and destroyed over the course of yeah. the fight. I really thought that was an interesting touch. Yeah, and j- since you brought up the House of Wax fight, the House of Wax fight was like two dudes going at it, which was um, 
you know, surprising and like pretty cool to see, but they also kept it in a wide shot the whole time. And mm-hmm. that, that I actually appreciate wide shots because that feels more um, like Hong Kong action, you know, like right. you're actually seeing these guys doing all this stuff and that's better. I think that's what I didn't like about the way this one was shot, but um, it was, it, it, like you said, it made it feel more visceral to have these like close up shots. And when you compare it to House of Wax, um, there's a lot more like inserts and stuff in this one. Yeah. For and, sure. I don't know. Just appreciate it in a different way. No, I feel you, dog. I feel yeah. you. Um, on that note, one of the things I really liked about this movie was how dark it was willing to go. Um, it was pretty dark. Yeah. It, there's a lot of like uh, parts where I was like, oh, I was like 1962 and they're like shooting dudes in the head and showing it and stuff. I think one of yeah, the, um, it's one of the other like platoon members that, um, Raymond Shaw kills is like a kid that they say is not even 18. Like, yeah, he looks too young to be in the army. And they just show him like being shot in the head. It's like, fuck, that that was visceral. That worked for me. Which we're, it it is oddly dark for a 1962 movie. And this movie, just so you know, um, was heavily censored around the world. And a lot of countries in Eastern Europe didn't get a premiere for this movie until like 1989 and the early 90s, depending yeah, on no surprise what, there. when they broke away from from Russia. Should so, we talk about what this movie, what these movies are about? Yeah, yeah. I just wanted to say one historic mm-hmm. thing about this movie bef- before I start ripping into it, because I once again <laughs> I didn't enjoy this film. But this was the first movie that a black actor was cast in a role that wasn't specifically specified as a black role in a script. So. Uh, there's a doctor who's part of the army intelligence that uh, Frank Sinatra is working for, who is like a psychologist. And apparently in the scripts, it didn't call any race or out or anything like that. But they, they got a black actor to play that role. And this is the first time ever a Hollywood movie cast a black man in a role that wasn't specified for a black man. So I thought that was pretty interesting. And I want to give a, a shout out to that before I uh, start ripping into this movie. Yeah. Mazel tov. <laughs> But yeah, we should we should uh, give the elevator pitch for this movie. Yeah, uh, do you want to do it or shall I? No, I'll let you do it. I'm not prepared for it at all. Um, I'm, I, I've got I just got an idea in my head for for the newer one. So okay, uh, so the plot of both these movies is pretty similar, but we'll co- sort of cover what's different in the updated version, I guess. Um, this movie revolves around two members of a military unit um, in the Korean War. And uh, who go missing and um, come back minus two of their members. And basically they've been brainwashed by, uh, it's like a Chinese Russian communist joint task force, right? A shadow, shadow operation that brainwashes them and wants to put um, a sleeper cell into, uh, into the U S government and have him kill whoever they want to kill. Frank Sinatra plays one of the other members of the unit who is essentially an investigator working to figure out why he's having these nightmares and what happened to his unit, try to prevent this from happening before it goes down. Yep, pretty much. Uh, There's a lot of flaws in this movie. Uh, One of the biggest ones, uh, Janet Leigh is in this movie. She's like, she's only in it for a minute, right? She's in it like twice in the movie so she there's a point where close to the beginning of the movie where ben marco frank sinatra is on a train and then like he just sees this this Mm -hmm. woman her name is eugenia and they just kind of talk and it seems like she might know a little bit about what's going on but doesn't really say anything explicit and then she's gone for like half an hour and then he runs into her again and she's like oh by the way i'm engaged but like her her character doesn't do anything in the plot like i looked up like four different synopses of this movie to try to figure out what the hell she was there for and she doesn't even her character doesn't even show up in any of these synopses and then there's an interview of her and she said yeah i don't know what the point of my character was it seems like i just came in and had a bunch of non sequiturs i didn't have any ties to any other character in this movie yet i appeared twice but I'm very proud of the work that I did, and I was really happy to be part of this movie. So, yeah, there, there's a whole character in this movie that the actor themselves is like, I don't know what the fuck I was doing in this movie. It's well, super weird. She was in Psycho two years prior, so I have a yeah. feeling that she was there to sell tickets and uh, have a female uh, lead in the movie. And I guess, like, Raymond Shaw has his has his girlfriend. His, his love interest, yeah. Maybe that should have just been Janet Leigh, but... Um, that would have made more sense. yeah. But I don't know. It's also 
I think this movie is also trying to hit a lot of noir tropes and you need to have a femme fatale in a noir movie and Raymond Shaw's girlfriend just isn't that character. Isn't that? No, not at all. So I think maybe that's what they were trying to do with Janet Leigh. They should have made the Angela Lansbury character more of a femme fatale, made her like hotter somehow. (laughs) (laughs) She's beautiful in this movie. (laughs) She is. What's weird is so she, she's only 37 in this movie. (laughs) I, it was 37 or 39 i don't remember but the the fact is she's only three years older than lawrence who plays her son uh <laughs> shaw so she's mothering someone who's only three years younger than her yeah that's i i i wrote that down with uh old blue eyes too he's 47 in this movie he he looks like he was 50 for like 30 years yeah and this is the end of those 30 years he looks old. <laughs> Like, and I'm at least thinking back, like I, he always kind of looked like that. I thought about that with Denzel Washington's character in the new one too. I was like, he's kind of old. Him and uh, Liev Schreiber are much older than the other two, but he's the leader of that unit. Like it makes sense yeah. that he's older. Um, and I don't think that this movie says that. I, I could be wrong. No, but... he was supposed to be like he was the captain. So he like Ben Marco was the leader of the squad. Forty-seven. And that's is why still there's... old. Yeah, but there is a point in the movie. Yeah, he is a little old for that, but yeah, he is the leader. And there's a point where Robert Shaw says something along the lines like, "I hated everybody in the team, ex- present company excluded." Yeah, they which say is that a big one too. Yeah, um, and that's a big part of the the character. So, to kind of expand on the 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 pitch that you made at the beginning or the summary, um, the idea is that Robert Shaw is that sleeper cell. And his whole job is they have him go around and kill people, and they brainwashed all the surviving people, uh, all the surviving soldiers, to like spread this story that he like single handedly saved everyone and got them through, uh, you know, behind enemy lines for three days and kept them safe, and you know, unfortunately wasn't able to save two people, but it is what it is, and he got the Congressional Medal of Honor. And but he's supposed to be an asshole. Like everyone says, like the catchphrase of this movie, he's the kindest, warmest, bravest man I ever met. He's my best friend. But he's an asshole. Like everybody hates him. Like there's a points where like he talks about how nobody could love him. He's not a lovable person. Only one woman has ever loved him. He's never had friends. Um, there's even like a big part of this movie is the doctor, the the black doctor. I don't know his name, but he comments when they when he's interviewing. Uh, Frank Sinatra about his dream he goes well what do you think about you know Robert Shaw and he says the the line he's the kindest warmest bravest person I ever met but then offhand he says something like I hate the guy he's the worst guy in the world he has no personality and then that doctor was like that's weird you just said he's the warmest kindest coolest dude in the world and that you want to blow him and now you're saying you hate him yeah and so it's it's I think that's I actually really like that dynamic of this movie where they really lean into the fact that the Robert Shaw who's arguably the second lead really? is not a likable character and he's not a likable man and everybody hates him but everybody thinks he's this great guy because soldiers on news reports have said he's a great dude. Yeah. There's I mean I'm with you. This movie um I guess the pacing was my my big issue with it because it didn't feel it didn't feel as coherent as the remake or as it could have been um yeah i didn't it's just kind of i know it's another it's another aging thing well also it's like totally, but it didn't, it didn't hold me throughout the whole thing i i agree i actually fell asleep and then had to like rewatch it the next morning <laughs> because i just like i wasn't engaged i started watching it at like 7 p.m and i fell asleep yeah. like 45 minutes into it yeah i was uh, fighting the also, urge to play with my phone Yeah, and then also, like, tonally, it doesn't really make sense. Because, like, you mentioned that it's pretty dark. Like, we both talked about, like, it's a pretty graphic fight scene for the 60s. And then we're also seeing people get shot in the head and blood running down their face. And uh, you're seeing people stabbed and everything. And and it's a pretty violent movie. And it's gory for 1962. But it also has these, like, weird, almost comical moments where they're, like, talking about brainwashing. He's like... He's been brainwashed so severely, he, he might as well be dry cleaned. And it's like, what? Like, it's weird how there's just like these weird jokes in the movie that like just don't really land. It feels like it's very early on in the genre. And yeah, they're, you know, they're uh, 
just figuring out um, what works and what doesn't and, you know, what kind of tonal shifts work. Yeah. Was, well, and there's uh, also points. Oh, go ahead. I was just going to, I was going to compliment it. I think there's a lot of stuff that does work as I don't want to say set pieces, but visual ideas and stuff like the, I feel like there's cool stuff happening in this movie. So for example, I, I agree. There's a, there's a scene, I think like a third of the way into the movie where we sort of realize that this is going to be about brainwashing or the mm -hmm. movie's letting us know for the first time. And they do a single shot that rotates 360 degrees and it starts on the the army men the group of um soldiers sitting behind a woman who's tr uh, dressed very um not formally but like she's going out for a nice brunch or something she's got nice little mesh gloves and her fancy hat and stuff and um she's just talking about plants about flowers hydrangeas and stuff and the guys are all bored and they're smoking cigarettes, but like they have to be there. And the shot rotates and there's all these old women just watching this, uh, this other woman talk. About, they're not all old women. All these women talking about this woman talking about plants and flowers and whatnot. And as the shot sort of completes its circle, the entire set has changed. And we realize that the soldiers are now in a, um, in an observing room and the person talking I think, I don't know if it happens at this point, but uh, in the next couple cuts, we realize that the person talking is actually this, um, I guess, Korean uh, scientist that is one of the people doing the brainwashing. Yeah. And he's speaking to the joint Korean, it's not Korean, it's task Chinese. Force. Chinese, it's, uh, Russian it's task Korean, force. No, it is, it's Korean, Chinese, Russian, and yeah. then just like other people. Like there are a bunch of like the bad communists. Americans big, too, like Americans who have been uh, big air flipped to join the the communists. Well, like yeah. the other thing that I think is weird about this movie, and I do agree, but that sorry, I, interesting. I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure my point is clear. I think that was really well done. It's really I agree. cool to see. And then throughout I that think scene, great visual stuff. Throughout that scene, it's like this really surreal thing where we're understanding like the uh, the flow of the scene and who's meant to be talking but visually sometimes it'll be this woman sometimes it'll be the the scientist and sometimes it'll be women in the audience and sometimes it'll be the um the you know the soldiers or whoever in the audience and during this whole scene um they have one of the soldiers i think raymond uh kill one of the other soldiers and it's just like they're just completely hypnotized and calm and like it's routine they're just they're um doing complacent or whatever just yeah. doing or obedient doing exactly what they're told and it's incredibly off-putting i thought that was done really well i like that a no lot. i i think th the the flashback scenes to when they're getting indoctrinated brainwashed whatever i think are really really good like it's almost like you mentioned an observing room but it's it's almost like they're filming like a tv show and like everyone's in the audience like they're on this like little stage and everyone's yeah. just kind of watching and you're right there there is this almost like 360 pan across so like they do interesting things like that like the end when they have like the sniper thing going on there's some cool shots there and they really set up this like large room and this like scope of like dude the killer could be anywhere there's a lot of great stuff in it but then every time i think something good is happening there's a weird thing like there's like three points in this movie where there's just some unnamed narrator that just narrates parts of the movie and it's just like where did this narrator come from and then there are yeah. other parts where it's just like characters who maybe should meet like i think this is done better in the newer one but we find out that frank sinatra has been having these dreams every night where he sees what actually happened he's seeing them being indoctrinated and he's seeing shaw kill people but he has the memory of the shaw rescuing him and then we find out that there's another soldier who's having the same dreams and frank sinatra goes to his superiors and is like dude this shit's weird and i think we should investigate it and they're like dude you have ptsd and we don't really trust you. We've just kind of given you this position and they kind of brush him off. And then like later in the movie, they're just like, oh, we got a letter from this other soldier and he says he had the same dream. So now we believe you go ahead and investigate this. And it's just, it's a little, it's just a very disjointed movie. And then it goes yeah. back and forth and all these different flashbacks. So there's a flashback to three years before the war. And we're like, a decade after the war or something like that like it's not explicitly clear when this movie actually is and at least i didn't notice it but it's some time after the korean war ended mm -hmm. and then we have a flashback that's three years before and then we also have flashbacks several times to the indoctrination and it's the, like it's never super clear like it's never really yeah. set up that we're changing timelines so it's yeah, just, i like, have the it's, same feeling it's I hard to watch i didn't realize until we watched the new movie that raymond fell in love with this girl before he went to war yeah and also because the guy doesn't look any younger you know what i mean no 
it's this 35 year old guy more who, than a decade earlier yeah yeah he's like so it's supposed he to be should like, be 20 or something yeah so i think this is supposed to be like no i think they might say 12 years but i don't know if it was 12 years after the war or it was 12 years after he met the girl right but it, and, it doesn't really make sense and that was another weird thing like he i couldn't tell if it was meant to be silly or not but he gets a snake bite i guess and then we yeah. we cut in on this woman like giving him uh or like uh, she's cutting giving him first open aid. With the razor blade yeah she's trying to get the poison out and then she's like i'm gonna ride away and get my dad he'll know what to do and the way she plays it is kind of goofy she like no, rides off and she like, like almost falls thing. off her bike well, she says that she's well like, it feels like a farce this... i feel like i'm watching yeah. a comedy and then i was like oh well, we're she being says serious something like my dad is a has a uh, a fear of snakes a phobia of snakes and everything he's just gonna love this like like it's good like he's validated that snakes can bite people i don't know what it was but she was kind of like jovial at the fact that this yeah. guy that she just met got bitten by some sort of snake yeah and then and they just fall in love and as soon as he meets the dad he says oh i want to marry your daughter you yeah it's like this, they just you met. met this woman 45 minutes ago yeah well then what's weird and you're is, like having venom hallucinations yeah well and then like we find out that so this guy, the the father, his name is Jordan. He's the uh, Thomas Jordan. He is the um, no, I'm sorry, it wasn't Thomas Jordan. It's Jordan something or uh, something. I Jordan. Think it's Michael Michael Jordan. Yeah. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I believed you for like half a second. I know. Uh, so it, the the crux of this movie it's, hinges it's, on. Um, sorry, I just, it's Michael B. Jordan. <laughs> Fuck you, dude. <laughs> so you have um, Angela Lansbury is Shaw's mom. Murder, she, she, wrote. she, yeah, murder. She wrote. She's also the the teapot in uh, Beauty and the Beast. But she's been, <laughs> she, in, she's been in a lot of things. Yeah, <laughs> um, she's great in this movie. But she's kind of like a a McCarthy kind of substitute. So she's just calling fucking everybody a communist. That and yeah, Her, that's a big that's a big part of the movie is uh, people being accused of being communists and stuff. Right. So what's weird is so she has her new husband who is a senator. And Robert Shaw hates his stepfather. Every time someone's like, oh, your dad. And he's like, he's not my fucking dad, idiot. Um, <laughs> but she's trying, the whole plot of this movie is what they're trying to do is they're trying to get the stepfather, Johnny, to be the vice president on the ticket. So this is taking place. They never actually say what party this is. Um, some of the things you hear, you would think because of how often, how much they're screaming against communism, you'd think they would be the Republicans. But there are other things that they say that kind of make it lean towards maybe it's Democrats. Who the fuck knows? They don't explicitly say that. Both movies, they always just say our party or his party or yeah. their party. Um, but they're trying to get him to be the VP. And then they're going to kill the presidential nominee. So that way Johnny becomes the presidential nominee at that point the de facto nominee and so she hates jordan calls him a communist but robert likes and him she had and sued like, him previously yeah oh no or he, he, sued, he her. sued her yeah for, uh, he sued her defamation. because he she called him a communist and like right. he was able to prove that he wasn't a communist and then when he comes back from the war he gets a job with jordan and she's like nope but then there's this like whole thing where she's like oh we should throw a party for the daughter because you were a dick to the daughter when you broke up with her and went to war. But it turns out, like, the mom wrote an angry letter and, like, forged his signature or he signed it. Like, he says, I don't remember if I signed it or if she just wrote it and forged my signature. But anyway, a letter went to this girl and broke up with her. And then I went to war. And then when he gets back from war, he goes to work with the father. But he says he's going to work for, as a journalist. But he, the guy's a senator. So, like, it doesn't really mesh. Like, none of it really makes sense. Yeah. And then... Angela Lansbury just has him kill people. And the biggest thing that I think is stupid about this movie that I think is drastically improved on the new one because it actually happens. There's a mistake in this because they picked a stupid trigger. But in this, there's two triggers. It's like asking a specific question. There's a verbal trigger. And then there's like a, a visual trigger. So anytime he sees the queen of um, diamonds in a deck of cards, he's open to suggestion. So that's why they're always telling him, oh, go play solitaire. And then when he sees the card, they'll be like, hey, you should go do this thing. And then yeah. he goes and does it. He gets tricked into marriage. Not tricked, but he ends up eloping with the girl because she wears a Queen of Diamonds costume for whatever reason. And so she like mentions, hey, we should get married. And then they just get married. It's super. It's a stupid trigger. And 
everybody figures it out. And so everybody's just like carrying around deck of cards that are all queen of diamonds so they could just like fuck with this guy. And then like, <laughs> and there's a whole section in the movie which totally didn't fit where they're like making him act like a duck and he's like eating, uh, you know, dirt from the ground and stuff. They're just having a lot of fun making him do goofy shit. And I was like, yeah, why is why is Frank Sinatra, uh, you know, telling this guy to drink water upside down? It doesn't make any sense. It, it doesn't. And then like, that's a joke that didn't really happen. No, but he like, <laughs> it's no, it didn't happen. But uh, <laughs> that's the section you fell asleep for. No, I, I, I went back and rewatched the whole thing, but it's just like, I would have liked if that kind of thing happened if they were like fucking with it. The biggest flaw I think in the movie is, and they address it in the newer one, is they just let all these like agents go, but they it seems like they only really care about Shaw and everything, but it's like, could could they not activate the other soldiers? And it turns was... out like one by one, the soldiers died and or committed suicide from PTSD and the nightmares and whatnot. Yeah, and that was something that struck me about the new movie too. Um, there's all these other guys in the unit, and I, I guess I, I guess I kind of buy that they just brainwash these guys to support Shaw, so that mm -hmm. they could like use him in interviews and have him say he was the uh, bravest, kindest, warmest, whatever. But they don't really say that, and that, I don't know if that really holds muster. So I kind of waved it away, but it it bugged me a little bit. Yeah, it just seems like you, if you spent the time doing this, why would you not, as a backup, have five assassins, as five sleeper like, cells versus one? That's something that The Departed does at the end of the movie. It's like a big twist. Like, yeah, of course we sent in other people undercover. Why would we yeah. only use you? Yeah. Yeah. That's a good plan. And duh. That, yeah. Yeah. You should have more than one mole if you can. Yeah. So I, I have lots of moles on my back. <laughs> basically, what's up happening at the end of the movie Shaw basically finds out what's going on. He he realizes that he's a pawn. He realizes that he's supposed to kill the presidential nominee. We realize that he's he, a very ugly crier. Yeah. <laughs> he he's he's tricked into or he's ordered to kill Jordan and in extension his new wife because she sees him kill Jordan and he's not allowed to get caught. So he has to kill anybody who's around or witnesses or whatever. So he kills his new wife, his father-in-law, and then was, he realizes... There's was another one of my favorite visual scenes from the movie. That he, was a great scene. Yeah, it's like very tense. He pulls a gun on Jordan, who tr like clearly trusts him implicitly, and uh, Jordan's the, the dad. And uh, he's like, hey, buddy, what are, you, what are you doing with the pistol? And he ends up shooting him, and he uh, shoots him through uh, a carton of milk that he's holding. That was a cool shot. Yeah, and all the milk spills on the floor, and it's in black and white, so it just looks fucking cool. And, uh, yeah, I, I really I enjoyed that part. And then he shoots his wife in the head, too, and I was like, yeah. oh, shit. This movie's, like, like kind of like, fucking around sometimes. Yeah, you hear, like, Robert, and then he turns, and then he just, without even thinking, just shoots her, and you just see her crumble to the floor. Yeah. So, no, that was a good scene, too. So, it's like, that was another thing that I really liked, but there there were three different actors in this movie who were white or hispanic playing korean people and it was just super weird so i'm just throwing that back out there really whitewashed film really bad it, it it's weird that they had the wherewithal i don't know if it was on purpose or what the deal was but to have that black man cast as a non specified black care, you know role but then have not throw in a couple like really any asian actors it, yeah. Like I don't, at this point, even today we have issues where they will just throw whatever Asian actors in there. They could be Korean, Jap the Japanese, whatever. And they'll just put whatever Asian actor in there and just like, yep, it's fine. Like you look at Pineapple Express, they just had they had literally like a every Asian comedic actor thrown in that movie at the end. It's just like really, come on. But yeah. so it's still an issue. But yeah, it was really off putting. But. Eventually what ends up happening is he realizes that he's the assassin. He has enough willpower to break through, and he decides not to kill the president nominee, but he ends up shooting his mother and stepfather. Yeah. And then kills himself. Cool. Yeah, that's the end of the movie. And then, you know, Marco's like, yep, cool. It's fine. And that's pretty much it. Like, it's... Yeah, I don't fine. feel like it's a fulfilling movie at the end. Like... I don't it's just, feel like it's just fine. Yeah, like I don't feel like anybody won. I don't feel like anybody lost. That not doesn't necessarily. It, it's almost like the the ending of Burn After Reading. It's like, so what did we learn about this? <laughs> yeah, and at the end of Burn After Reading, that's like the punchline that ends the movie, and it sort of makes sense because it's like a, it's almost a send up of 
bureaucracy and yeah you know uh, assuming that adults know what they're doing which is obviously after four years of this shit not always the case yeah so like there's a message to that and it kind of and the new movie we'll get into it but i feel like kind of does the same thing where it's it's bleak but it's uh it's it's trying to make a point and this one just kind of felt like it did not i don't want to say that it wasn't trying to make a point but it feels like it's not connecting what it's trying to say and i think part of that's just because the movie overall is a little disjointed like it's edited poorly it's got some weird decision choices with having a narrator a couple of times throughout the movie who's not a a voice that we recognize like it's just i i think you're right what, what you said earlier that like it tried some things I just don't think a lot of it's. I don't think it stuck the landing on a lot of things. Like it, it took some big swings, but I don't think it connected. I don't think any part of this was a home run. Yeah, I do like that um, that fight scene that you're talking about at the beginning of uh, Frank Sinatra versus the uh, Italian Korean guy um, <laughs> <laughs> was. I like that that ended up being uh, something that Christopher Nolan did an homage of in his Batman movies later where uh, Batman's just beating the shit out of a guy like Frank Sinatra and going, where's the trigger? Where's the trigger? Because that's basically what Frank Sinatra was doing. <laughs> um, I think he was so. asking what like what Shaw was doing in a room yeah. or something. Why was he there? there? Why was he there? And there's also like the other thing that didn't make sense about this movie. And I think they did a good... They did similar things in the new movie, but I think they did it better. But in this, it's like Ben goes to, to Shaw a couple of times and it's like, it's really weird. Like he comes in and is like, yeah, I totally fought your, like they say the word Oriental several times. Like I totally fought your Oriental chef. Uh, I, maybe I should send him a Christmas card or some shit like that. It was a really weird thing. It's like they soup, like they acknowledge almost that they're enemies without, you know, but not necessarily on purpose. It's, it's just weird. I don't really understand what their dynamic was and all their interactions in the middle of the movie. Yeah. Like it didn't, I, I don't know. I, this movie confused I think- the hell out of me. I think this movie succeeds at being uh, unsettling. I think it's it's meant to That's be, fair. and it ends up being. So, I want to end with a compliment. Have some coke on me. Jesus, what did you do? What did you do? What the fuck did you do? What did I do? You fuck with the bull, you get the horns. That's what I did. So, what have you been up to, bud? Yeah. And with that being said, what have you been up to, bud? Um, I've been up to the same thing that the entire country was up to, just watching watching the election for uh, watching a map four for, days straight for four days. Yep, a map that does not change. No, nope. um, I watched a bunch of Harley Quinn. I'm still I started the second season. I'm still doing that. Nice. A lot of fun. Really, really enjoy that. I rewatched The Mask, which holds up surprisingly well. Yeah, we did that on Ruin My Childhood a few years back, and it's we so we good, man. enjoyed it as well. I didn't realize how much money that movie made. It was the most oh, profitable huge. comic book movie until Joker last year. I heard rumors over the last couple of weeks that uh, they're trying to get him to do two more mask movies. The two seems ambitious, but I, I buy that somebody after him, you know, being on SNL as Joe Biden, you know, people going, "Hey, you know, maybe we should get Jim oh, I mean, Carrey doing back, you know, some I think, of his old things." No, I think they've been asking him to do that stuff every year since 1994. So I'm sure. I, don't, I don't think that's a new thing, but I think um, I think he's getting big again. I think because he, he hasn't been doing a ton of stuff lately. I mean, he did Sonic last year. Oh, that's right. Oh, that was this year, bud. Ugh. <laughs> that's what it seemed. But God, like, was, that Sonic, yes, was that 2020? Was that the two months where we got to go to the theaters? Fuck, man. Yeah. What else? I watched Life Aquatic with Steve Zissou. Oh, that's a great film. Been a minute. I can love that. I hate watch Justice League. Um, just Why just would you do that when you know we're going to cover that in like six months? I'll watch it in six months. That's okay. Uh, I re- But the night before that, I watched Mad Max Fury Road, which is a perfect oh, movie. Fucking fantastic. That was my favorite movie of 2015. I must. I think I saw that like five or six times in theaters that year. Yeah, it's so good, man. I rewatched the original Muppets movie. Or not original, sorry. The, the Jason Segel, the re- reboot sort the of. The reboot. Yeah. We had a pretty um, good riff on, on Twitter going about Jason Segel and the Muppet movies. Yeah, if you're not following us on Twitter, that's the kind of uh, content that you're missing. Uh, I also watched Most Wanted, which is like pretty fun, but Most really missed the Oh, the Muppets Most Wanted. Yeah. yeah. I didn't realize that's where the evil Kermit uh, meme came from. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I didn't know. I, saw <laughs> I like the Muppets. I, I, yeah, I like I all the Muppet movies. I, I think my favorite one's still Muppets in Space or Muppets I, from Space. 
I have, I definitely haven't seen all of them, and I haven't seen any besides uh, the Jason Siegel one from 2011 since I was a kid. So I kind of want to go back and rewatch all of them. Maybe that's our next. Uh, oh, theme. our next bonus episode. <laughs> yeah, that could be fun. And Adam's Family Values, which is also fantastic. Oh, fantastic. That's all I watched. So I uh, I had a lot of time. Katrina's been working. Um, she was lucky enough to get uh, about two weeks worth of work on, on one show. So she's That's been great. gone. So I've been able to watch a lot of stuff. So I finished Shit's Creek. I uh, got through that. Fuck yeah. What do you mean got it's, through? It's fantastic. It's fine. I don't think Fuck it's off. anywhere near the best show of the last five years like people like to think the fourth season which just won all the awards i don't even or the sixth season i don't even think the sixth season's the best season i honestly well, thought the last season was one I mean, of the I, worst seasons i think that's a silly nitpick because you know that awards uh i know it shows will, but it's yeah. i think it's odd that this is the year that like because it's the last but like i honestly thought I, I thought season three the latter half of season three and season four were the best and honestly i like i just kind of got through the rest of it like i got through season one and two started to see what it was about in season three enjoyed season four and like season five and six were just kind of like eh, like it's oh, it's i don't trust your opinion about anything now it's it's totally watchable and but like if this was something that i had to watch like if i had to watch one season and then wait for another season i wouldn't watch it like i don't know if i would have watched it a season at a time i think this was a show that i could only watch as a bingeable show that's wild yeah i i thought it was fine maybe it's just because so many people built it up but i just thought it was I, I, there were Every season, there was at least one or two episodes where I would laugh my ass off. So there were moments where I laughed my ass off. But I'd say overall, it was a little cringy. And I think it's maybe because I didn't like a lot of the characters. You thought it was cringy? In certain points, like, I fucking hated uh, Chris Elliott's character, um, Roland. I yeah. fucking hated him. Like, and, and I know he's supposed to be annoying. But a lot of times you have characters like Roland, like Dwight Schrute. They're not supposed to be likable. But after a while, you grow to love them and recognize what they do for the show overall and what they do for the other characters. Now, there's certain things I really liked. Like, I liked how they handled inclusion in the show. Like, very early on, we find out that um, that David is, is Pan. And it's just like one character asks him about it. And then it's like never really acknowledged. Like, everybody accepts him for who he is. And I think that's great. And they did that on purpose. Like I, I saw an interview with him. He's like, yeah, that was the point. Like we acknowledge that there are people out there that are different, but this town is a, an accepting town. So everybody just went with it. Also, Patrick was way too good for David. I didn't buy that. <laughs> Mike, I think what we've learned from this review is that you hate joy. But it's not a joyful show. Like yes, it is. It's not a joyful about? show at all. It absolutely is. It is not a joyful show. Anyway, it's fine. And that's all I have to say. Like, I don't think I'll go back to it. Yeah, if you have a black bottomless pit in your chest where your heart should be, then you probably won't like the show. But if you enjoy Joy, then you might like it. Yeah, I, I, that, I think too it's harsh? very overrated. It's <laughs> perfectly fine. It's perfectly watchable. Some of the other things I watched, we, uh, we I watched The Thing uh, a couple weeks, like a week and a half back. Fucking fantastic. Oh, yeah. Katrina Dude. thought Kurt Russell died. And I had to let her know, like, dude, Kurt Russell's still kicking. Like, he's got that new Santa Claus movie coming out, like, Didn't she in say a couple that weeks. For uh, Furious 7? Well, we, I, brought, I brought it up during our Furious 7 episode because we watched, the day before we recorded was when we watched the thing. Uh, we also started a new show, uh, You, which is also on Netflix. It started out as a Lifetime show and then became a Netflix original. And it's, like, the third season's filming now. It's... It's it's kind of like the CW version of Dexter. I mean, instead of Dexter killing criminals, like he kills people who gets in the way of his love with whatever girl he's stalking that year. And uh, it's another one of those shows that if you if you couldn't binge it, could it's almost unwatchable. And I think it starts out like it seems like it's a really smart like the the writing is snappy, it's witty, the character seems smart initially. You're like, oh, this is like a new Dexter, and then it like all the characters are terrible and all of them are stupid. And it's just like, there's no way this guy got away with like all the murders he got away with. Cause he's an idiot. But how far into it are you? Uh, we're halfway through season two, I think we're like three or four episodes into season two. Word. And yeah, watch the fourth season of Rick and Morty that dropped on HBO max, uh, last week. Had you not seen it? No, I hadn't. Cause I don't pay for cable. I just do the streaming stuff and I wait for things to come out. I got the season pass for that one. I loved every episode. I just, 
I got through it so fast. I got through it in two days, and I was just like, oh, that's it? I, I thought it was a great season. Like, the episodes are all fantastic. I liked every single one, so yeah. I, I don't fault the season. I was just surprised. I expected the finale to be a little bigger. Like, I really expected Evil, evil Morty, and that, that didn't come. But it was still a fantastic season. But yeah, that's that's everything that I watched, I think. I, I'm pretty sure I watched some other shows. I need a new half-hour show. Cause I like to have like a short show that I binge for like when Katrina is like taking a shower or she's like, I'm coming home soon and I've got like 20 minutes or something I can watch on my lunch. So if anybody has any suggestions for like a half-hour show that I can binge that has you know at least a few seasons, that'd be cool. I, Let me know. Yeah, the, ask the audience for suggestions, but not me. All right. Yeah, I don't care about you, dude. I'm trying to get engagement, well, bro. You don't like uh, Shit's Creek, so I don't know what I would suggest to you. Yeah. Most of the other sitcoms you like, like Community, fucking love Community. Just rewatch Community. I, I just rewatched it not too long ago. So I'm not, have you I seen Spaced? Really... I have seen Spaced. I love Spaced. I love Edgar Wright and Simon Pegg. Hell yeah. Yeah. No, I love like, everything they do. Yeah. All right. Like, yeah. Let's get back into this. So. 2004, Manchurian Candidate. Uh, this was like came out right when our theater opened, like within a month or two of the theater that I worked at being open. Um, this is not one that I actually watched at the time. Like, I had no interest in politics as a 15 year old in California, a 15 white <laughs> kid in California. Politics, in my mind, didn't really affect me. I didn't care about it. So everything seems understand. pretty great to me. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> pretty much. I was also like very conservative when I was younger, because um, my oh. parents are very conservative. What town did you grow up in again? I grew up in Morgan Hill, California. So between Gilroy and San Jose, it's a yeah, very conservative town. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, it was weird, but. uh Elevator pitch for this one. You're the executive. I'm I'm the little guy trying to pitch this, and I go. By the way, I I keep on every time we do an elevator pitch. I realize that really I'm supposed to be like pitching it to you as an executive so that you buy the idea, and I end up doing it more as like a synopsis. So I mean, that's I'm gonna, what it's supposed to be. I, no, no, even I've no, done there, it that. I only did there's it the a one time. Though. Yeah, there's, I've there's only a did difference. It the one time, and I, an actual pitch. I prefer the idea of doing it as a pitch because that seems yeah, like a lot it. more fun. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to try to remember that for next time. It's, it's all good, bud. I'll, I'll, I'll try to remember to tell you to do it like Thank that you. next time. So we're like 2004. Was there an election in 2004? Yeah, that was the second time Bush got elected, um, which ties in directly into this movie. So, hey, it's an election. The last election. It's a little contested. Bush lost the, lost the popular vote, but won. I think it's time for another political thriller. And uh, I think we should dust off Manchurian Candidate. This time, though, we're going to do it like it's a Halliburton kind of corporation that's the bad guy and not necessarily like the communists. We're going to get some big names. We're going to get Leif Schreiber. He's hot off of the Scream franchise. We're going to get Denzel. He just did Man on Fire. We're gonna, it's going to be great. We've got Helen, uh, Helen Mirren. I almost said Helen. We've got Meryl Streep. <laughs> and, uh, also we're good. Really gonna also good. Yeah, also great. And uh, we're really going to modernize this movie and make it a thriller. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make people uneasy. It's going to make people see that uh, both sides of the aisle are bad guys. We're never even going to say who, what party anybody is. And we're going to let people draw their own conclusions and realize that just the government overall is bad. Sounds great. Let's make yeah. it. Let's fucking give me $90 million to make this. <laughs> is that oh, what the budget I was? I have no idea. Oh, but I do know the budget of the original one. I meant to bring it up. So the original movie had a budget of two point two million dollars. Uh, in nineteen sixty two, 1962 money. A uh, million dollars went to Frank Sinatra. Two hundred thousand went to Shaw, or not Shaw? Well, Shaw is the character uh, Lawrence who played Shaw. And then, so the rest of the movie was made on a million dollars. So everybody else's salary, all the special effects, everything else was done for a million dollars. So. Yeah, and that is what Frank Sinatra commanded at the time. It's not. Yeah. That's not well, the other thing he did was um, he is on a, apparently Frank Sinatra from years and years and years of doing the Vegas thing can't go to sleep before like five a.m. So they shot this entire that entire movie whenever they could from between eleven p.m. and five a.m. Cool. Yeah. Fucking Frank um, Sinatra. The budget for this was eighty million dollars, and it made ninety six million in the box office. That is what nice. we call a flop. Yeah. And it's surprising. I don't know if it's surprising because I remember a lot of people watching this movie at my theater, you know, but it's just, you know, a small Morgan Hill. You know, at the time it was an eight theater 
chain, so it was nothing huge. But I remember seeing a lot of people going into this movie. So that honestly surprises me it didn't do anything, especially like in 2004, Denzel was pretty big. I don't know. It can't, it, it's not that surprising to me. I feel like this movie improved on the original. Yeah. And I think it um, justified its own existence. I think it deserved to be remade. And I think it, yeah, I think it improved on the original. Uh, but I think similarly to the original, it was a little disjointed and just sort of missed the mark. And that's like in 2004, especially um, a political thriller is uh, not the most popular genre. You know, no, no. If you miss the mark a little bit, yeah, it's going to flop. So one of the things that I liked a lot more about this is I, I think this movie did a lot better of doing the, the showing versus telling. So in the first movie, we're just constantly being told that Shaw isn't likable. He says he's not likable. And you do see um, you do see him have a little bit, a couple of outbursts towards people. But in you this don't really movie, get anything about Shaw's character in the first movie. Like you don't no. see him do anything until no. like 30 minutes in. Yeah. Where this one, like it opens up with like a bunch of the guys playing cards in the back of like a Humvee, which I think is a great nod to the original movie. And you have Denzel's talking to like their guide in, I think they were in Kuwait. Um, like trying to figure out how they're going to get to wherever they're going to get to. And then they get ambushed and you see like the whole time they're like, before the ambush happens, Denzel says something. He plays Ben Marco. He says something to Shaw, who's played by Lee Schreiber. And like, weird. Leif, yeah. <laughs> but he's like super awkward, Lee Schreiber. And like almost like I would have thought, I'm like, oh, maybe it's not that he's not likable in this. Maybe he's like autistic or something. Like that's kind of like the vibe I got from him from the opening scene. He's just uh, different. He's different yeah, he's just, and, it, and it, it's a little off putting. You can't tell what's yeah. going on, but he's not yeah, so one like, of the guys, which is the whole yeah. point of that card. Well, so then scene. he goes to like, so he's like, hey, leave Schreiber. Like, we're going to head out in two minutes. Like, go tell the boys that we're going to like leave. So, like, he goes to the back of the Humvee, opens it up, and he's like super awkward. It's like, hey, guys, uh, we're leaving. And like, the characters, like the guys in the back of the, the truck, I think I wrote it down. Including uh, the Falcon, Anthony Mackie. I don't think that was Anthony Mackie, was it? It was, yeah. Oh, okay, cool. I didn't realize that was him. I he's, thought it looked like him, young, but I don't want to assume. Much younger. They also had a young, like they, it seems like they de-aged Jeffrey Wright a little bit too. He looked really young because he's, I think he's only just young, man. But this is only two years before Casino Royale and Casino Royale, he looks exactly the same there as he does in like <laughs> in Westworld. So uh, I, I feel like they did something to de-age him a little bit, but um, they say something like, man, that cat needs a friend and a hug. Like, we see right away that his team doesn't necessarily get along with him. They think he's weird. Right. And then they get ambushed. And we see like Leif Schreiber jump up on a turret and he's like, gah, 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 like killing everybody. And then of course we find out that this is a same thing. It's brainwashing, you know? Um, but I kind of like that we got a better idea and saw the events as to what the people believe happened. I, I liked that. And I liked being shown that this guy's awkward and, not necessarily likable, but he's still a functioning person. And I also like the update to this in that the previous movie I thought never really made sense where they're like, oh, we're just going to have an assassin who's adjacent to political people versus in this movie, it's he is he's they kind of merge his stepfather from the original movie and him. So they he's a congressman and they get him to be the VP. And then the plot overarching plot is they want to kill the presidential nominee so he becomes president i think yeah. that makes a hell of a lot more sense and streamlines the movie in a good way and his mom also plays a senator herself instead of yeah. the wife the woman behind the power which makes sense in 1962 but i thought this was a really nice way to merge all of these things so they're a little bit more streamlined it makes a lot more sense that you would want yeah. your assassin it's like they don't they didn't even want to use him as an assassin like they the only time he killed in this movie was like because their whole plot was about to get unraveled. So they kind of like panicked and like all the, like the, 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 the Manchurian is a, is a company versus a, a country. Manchurian global. Yeah. So I kind of liked that, you know, 2004 makes a lot of sense. It's kind of like how yeah, Burton. Right. I also thought that was great because it was less about, um, the you know the enemy or the other which kind of brings its own problems with like oh the the chinese and the koreans are bad you know it's the communism mm -hmm. it's somebody who's not white blah 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 um i think that was a nice way for this movie to address a more relevant political climate in 2004 where we're much more worried about 
um, corporations overstepping their their bounds and getting involved in the government and you know um, controlling uh, politicians and it's sort of you know if this movie is I think it's trying to say this is you know maybe not the logical extension but it's just a step beyond lobbying and bribing these politicians well, and, which and is I something that something that we're still dealing with right now you know 16 I think years this, this movie, movie was just out. a little too early because in 2004 obviously 9-11 happened in 2001 um if we had watched we this worked. movie, if we had watched this movie a month ago, it would have felt too real to deal with. I think so. I think I think the biggest issue is like in 2004, we were still that raw, raw, raw America. We, you yeah, know, it's only we were three kinda, years after 9/11. Yeah, we were just maybe starting to realize, hey, maybe we shouldn't have gone to Iraq. But that was like the very beginning of that. That was like before we really realized what Cheney and Halliburton were doing. Um, right. So I think this was a little too early. I think if this came even in two thousand four four years later, we would recognize at that point all the shit that Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham were doing, just the blocking literally anything and everything that the Democrats wanted to do. And then same thing even now with Trump. You know, obviously the Democrats are doing everything they can to block the shitty policies of Trump. Um, I think this would have played out a lot better after we figured out everything about Halliburton, after we started seeing what Mitch McConnell was doing. Um, but what I think is great about it is they never explicitly say what party any person in this group is part of. Um, yeah, it, you, we it, don't know what John funny, Voight, John they... Voight plays um, Jordan in this one. And then, but you, you never know is, are they both Republicans? Cause it kind of seemed like they were on the same side. Like they were the same party, Jordan and, and, um, Shah's mom so it's like what what's going on like who are these people what's going on I think it just would have played a lot better now or a few years in the future yeah um I mean I, I have a I have a counterpoint to that I don't think you're wrong but I think I don't think you're wrong but my counterpoint would be I think this is a story that can be remade uh every 20 years and, I think so. And as long as it's put fair. in the hands of a competent filmmaker, it's still relevant. So I think it, you know, coming out in 2004, it dealt with the things that were uh, relevant at that time in uh, in an effective way. And I think they could remake this uh, in 2022 uh, and sort of deal with some of the stuff that, you know, the inevitable aftermath of the, the Trump debacle. Um, I'm interested to see, that would be an interesting idea. I think you're right, seeing like, you know, people getting using like social media and like memes and messages on the dark web or through forums and everything and misinformation to like brainwash people. I don't know. Like, you're, I think you're right that they. Yeah, I mean, we're still dealing with again. we're still dealing with corporations trying to get their um, fingers into the uh, into the government, you know? Yeah. Um, so it, it almost is too similar. It's almost the, it would be too similar to the uh, to the to the second movie with Denzel. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I think I, when I was watching this, I was like, man, I think they could make these every couple decades, every generation. There could be one of these. I, I think you're right. I, it's, it's just a matter. I, I think when I said it was too early in 2004, I just think in 2004, a political, like literally a couple really of years. Make, yeah. Just because at that point we were still kind of all like America. So Fuck, I'm yeah. looking at the, um, there's a scene in this movie where, uh, uh, Meryl Streep's character is in front of a whiteboard that says projected electoral votes and it's got a map mm. of the country and they've written in all of the um states with like a, a red or a blue sharpie mm -hmm. and i think i think if we really looked at this we could figure out whether oh you know what they're republicans i'm looking at the thing now and his name is written in red arthur the um oh, is the it? president that okay. they're trying to be yeah but you're right like they really make a point of like not um tying either polit uh, tying a political affiliation to these characters but i think ultimately they're republican and that kind of makes sense the i took a picture of it and the picture that i'm looking at has the entire middle of the country and the south in blue actually i think a lot of these are black but texas is blue for sure and i remember um she's blocking california in my picture but i remember california was red hmm. yeah so I, <laughs> it almost looks like it's a map from 1962 yeah, that's interesting because I, I I read something that the filmmakers were specifically trying not to make it obvious what party is what. Yeah, and I mean, like I said, I, I, 
California is red is Republican in this movie. And I don't think California has been Republican since, since uh, Reagan. Reagan, maybe. Yeah. Um, maybe a little bit after, but it's been a blue state for a long time. Yeah. Um, so I think what they're probably trying to do is, I don't think you can make a movie in 2004 and like be convincingly apolitical or blur the lines that much. But yeah. I think that's what they're trying to do. I think they're like, well, you know, maybe we'll flip the states here and the way that he talks in this scene will be a little bit different. And it's just, it's not the point well, of the movie. So people New won't York. ask too many questions. So like, that's the other, like New York has pretty much always been blue and he's a congressman from New York. So it's like, that also makes it think of, okay, they could be Democrats as well. So it's like, it doesn't really make sense, but it also doesn't really matter. Cause I think the point yeah. of the movie is that, uh, and, and Meryl Streep even says it at one point, like as everything kind of comes to a, a boiling point at the end of the movie, um, and Ben and Ben and Shaw have several meetings throughout the movie, and some of them are very aggressive, some of them are friendly. Um, we can go through some of them in a little bit, but at towards the end of the movie, there's a point where uh, John Voight, who plays Jordan in this, after having a meeting with with Ben Marco, goes to Meryl Streep and leaves Schreiber and is like, "Look, dude, like you're compromised. No matter no matter if this is bullshit or not, there's no way that if this got out that you can spin this like." we're going to lose the white house. And this is where you can kind of think that maybe they're Democrats is they say, we can't go another four years without our party getting in the office. And based off the timeline, if it's supposed to be like actual America, you can infer that maybe a Republicans in office. Once again, it doesn't really matter because the point is Meryl Streep says, yeah, they're my biggest backer, but they also pay for people on both sides of the aisle. So it's like this Halliburton esque Manchurian um, global financing pays people on both sides of the aisle to manipulate everything. So, I mean, we could probably presume in, in this one, we definitively know that there's more than one agent that can be activated because at a certain point we find out when they realize they've been brainwashed that both Shaw and Ben killed somebody as an example. And then the crux of this movie, the climax is it's kind of reversed. It's a twist, but Shaw is supposed to be the target and so it's supposed to look they set up ben marco like he's a stalker and there's a, there's reasons why it works but at the end of the movie we're supposed to believe that ben marco is a is a stalker and that he's going to shoot he's ordered to shoot um, shaw and then shaw changes the instructions and has him actually shoot him but the idea was supposed to be that he barely misses shaw and hits the vp the actual president nominee so shaw can become president and it's it's a little convoluted um yeah, it's weird. I, I liked it. I liked that kind of idea that like Denzel could be activated at any point as well. Yeah, I thought it was a nice little twist from the original too. Um, it makes a lot of sense that you would have be able to do this. Like maybe they put more resources into Shaw and that his brainwashing is better. And that's why he didn't start having dreams until towards the end as they were activating him to do stupid things like certain things. But before that, he didn't really realize he was a, a tool. I, I kind of liked that. Like, you know, they put, they did a better job because they actually have him go through surgery and put in a new implant and a new, they reinstate the the brainwashing like about halfway through the movie. So I think that kind of makes sense that like, okay, we could do this with anybody, any, any of these soldiers who are still alive, but it's better to do it with this guy because he's well positioned. Yeah. Uh, Eugene makes much more sense in this movie. <laughs> She's actually an FBI yeah. agent. I yeah, like, I like that, that they cleaned that up. Um, the Jocelyn Shaw relationship was kind of nothing in this. Like, I mean, kind of. It's it's small, but I think it makes more sense that she was. You know, they had a relationship before he went to uh, before he went, enlisted in the army, and the mother sort of ruined it. And he's always like harbored feelings for her, and then he tries to reconnect with her, and she's like, she's Dude, like, it's we, been we fifteen kids. years. Yeah, we were kids. Like, it's fine, but we I've moved on, and so should you. Um, and that also gives him a little bit more, like, um, I don't know, pathos later on in the movie that he's upset about that or misses her or whatever. Um, so I like that. I didn't mind. I think it stayed a small role, but it made more sense and yeah. felt more natural. No, it's time. more. It makes way more sense than just being gone from fifteen years and then deciding to get married the se the first time you see each other again. Yeah, it's super weird. Yeah, uh, the other thing that's weird about this movie, and it turns out like this is in the book and it's this, but uh, 
she totally fucks her son, uh, Meryl Streep. Yeah, that was one of my notes. Incest, all in caps. Yep. So there's a point at the end of the movie where she's, he knows he is a tool. Like he, she knows that he knows that she, he can manipulate, be manipulated. And she says like, Hey, this is what's going to happen. I'm going to set it up where you're the target. But in reality, we're really going to shoot the other guy and we're going to set up your friend, Ben Marco. And then she like says the little like code words, like winter soldier. And then she like kisses him. (laughs) And then kisses him again, and then kisses him on the lips, and then it fades to black. But she's got like a she's got a look in her eyes that's yeah. like, "Yo, we're about to do this." And apparently, like the, there is a line that she like he is almost exactly the same as his father. So, but yeah, she totally fucks him. Apparently, in the book, it's like explicit, like that they fuck. Yeah, it's crazy. I I kind of I like that there's something crazy in the movie, but at the same time, it's it that, almost feels like, hey, is that necessary? Yeah, it's a little weird. I didn't like and it. And also feels weirdly you know this book was written before the first movie obviously so this book is uh 60 70 years old yeah um but it you know also feels weirdly relevant with the QAnon stuff (laughs) not that that's something that's really happening but eh, you know jeffrey epstein on some level it is so i don't know no it's super weird um, I really liked the end of this movie and like, we're kind of jumping around on this one a lot, but like the end of the movie, they set up Ben to be the killer. And so he, he goes in his uniform, he's at the, this, the DNC or RNC, whatever party it is, but they're nominating the president and vice president candidates. No, that was, it was the election. He won presidency. No, no, no. This was the, the nomination. Oh no. This, so, no, so, no, that was the beginning of the movie. The nominee. Yeah. They, yeah. they, they won. Uh, yeah. So yeah, this is this them accepting. This is election night, and they're in this like big open, just banquet hall. And the Eugene, who is an FBI agent, is she goes by Rosie in this movie, right? She goes by Rosie. Well, they, that was in the last movie too. Um, that that was a whole thing. Like, oh, I'm Eugene, but I'm Eugene Rosie. I'm also like she had like three names. So that that was almost the same in both movies but she knows something's up and she's just in this room with thousands and thousands of people with balconies everywhere and like vents everywhere and, and she it's sees like, leo schreiber keep on looking at a balcony yeah and so but she's looking and looking and looking and then she goes to like the security room and sees that denzel comes but she like she knows that denzel wouldn't do this unless he was brainwashed so she doesn't want to like necessarily like call attention that denzel's there so it's like that's I thought that was an interesting thing, but there's like all this tension because she knows something's going to go down. And then, like you said, like Lee Schreiber telegraphs what's going on. So she gets there right after Denzel shoots Lee Schreiber and um, Meryl Street, right as he's going to kill himself, just like the last movie. But she's able to stop it before it happens. Uh, yeah. And then you get like him be going to like some camp to be like de brainwashed. At the end of the movie, yeah. Well, that's the, what's the uh, end of a brain. What's the getting... opposite of brainwash? Is it? Oh, I guess it's like deprogramming, but it's like uh, I was going to say like brain mudding. <laughs> not a very <laughs> yeah, good but joke. then yeah, that's confusing. Um, <laughs> that's, that's not what. At the end of this movie, though, he's going back to where they were brainwashed, yeah. and they're the FBI is sort of like, oh, this is where it happened and stuff, and he's like showing them around. I think it was supposed to be like closure, like he he's accepting yeah, exactly. what happened to him. Um, but that's not the brain muddying that you're talking no, about. No, not really. Um, I think the implication is that he would have been. Like, they would have gone through and tried to figure it yeah, out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, There's also a, a scene there where they um, they take some security footage and they deep fake him to make him look like Larry Bird. I thought that was kind of cool. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I liked um, in this, it was a little weird. It's a little jarring. But, like, there's a point where he... Ben shows up and after talking with Jeffrey Wright and he's like, I have these dreams, you have these dreams, uh, like maybe we should figure this out. But he shows up to like some party and sees um, Shaw and he's like, hey, it's me, Ben. And like he like taps him on the shoulder and Shaw's like, don't touch me. Don't fucking touch me. Get get him the fuck out of here. And then like Secret Service like pulls him away. But then later on, like he's just in a crowd and he's just like, hey, Shaw. And he's like, Captain Ben, what's up, buddy? And like hey, pulls him out of the crowd and then like takes him into a private office and has a meeting and even like talks about this. Like Ben's like, dude, I I've been having these dreams where you killed somebody and I also killed somebody. Like maybe we yeah, should he talk treats this him with out. compassion, like a friend. Yeah, he actually but it was like super weird how he was like super angry the first time he saw him, but then the second time he was like, 
totally cool. And but then think, he has a, a thing. Like, but I think that makes sense because his his head's been opened up and yeah. scooped out. So like that was a little strange, but there was that compassion because there is a point where um, the mom's like, you need to like fucking get the like press charges and he's like dude i'm not gonna press charges he's my captain best case scenario like he has ptsd and like he's crazy but like i don't want him to go to jail where it's gonna get worse like i want him to get help and if just listening is enough to help him like i thought that was interesting it was just like these huge swings in terms of personality yeah. um, no i like that though and i think leo schreiber did a good job um and then he bit him. making those make sense yeah i liked when he bit him that was uh one of my notes also the exact midpoint of the movie yeah, I also well, liked when he, he, uh, the, the, f him killing Jocelyn and Jordan, I thought was a lot more visceral and emotional in this because like John Boy is very much like, dude, I care about you and mm -hmm. like, I don't want this to happen, but we also need to look at what's best for the country. And if there's any chance at all that you're compromised, we can't allow this to continue. And so the mom, um, Helen, uh, why do I keep wanting to call her Helen Mirren? Meryl Streep is like just activates the sun and tells her to go kill tells him to go kill john boyd and like the company's like why the fuck did you do this like we have meetings for this like you just like put a big target on us but he goes out like wades out into this middle of this like river where john boyd's kayaking flips the kayak over and just prevents john boyd from getting out of the kayak so he drowns and then his ex-girlfriend shows up and then he just like holds her underwater i think it's a much more visceral an impactful way of killing these people who were at one point close to him. It's, it's much more hands-on. Like, obviously it's very much more. Yeah. Cause it's not being shot. Yeah. I th one of my notes for that scene was, um, so a, a difference between this movie and the original is that in the original, um, everyone knows immediately that Raymond killed his new wife and, uh, father-in-law. And that's why he becomes the assassin because yeah. he's sort of already on the lam and he's got nothing else to lose or his you know reputation can't be ruined anymore. Um, but in this movie, uh, it's a secret. It just looks like um, it looks like his kayak capsized and the daughter went out to save him and she was overtaken by the cold by the water cold. or whatever. Um, and Do you then, know why they, that, they made it about the cold? And that's why Raymond got to um, continue to go on to be the vice president or whatever. But my note was... Um, it's pretty lucky that this like mindless killing machine leaves a perfect crime scene, uh, that nobody suspects any foul play right. or knows that it was him, you know, but he's supposed to be like almost totally brainless. Like he's not, he's not actively thinking, how do I kill these people so that it looks like an accident? Like he literally just goes and kills the guy in the easiest way possible for the moment that he's in. Well, and it's, you're right where it's weird that nobody suspects foul play because they mentioned that john boy is an expert kayaker and like how did this happen yeah um the other thing that's a little weird about it is just like dude he's at this point like they're in the middle of an election where are this how did he get rid of his secret service people yeah that's weird but um i think the reason Agreed. they brought up the cold is in the in the original movie there's a point where they say they're in a bar and this is when Frank Sinatra finds out about the, the Queen of Diamonds trigger is he's playing um, solitaire in the bar. And then someone says, like, go jump in the river or some shit like that. And so he goes and jumps in the river. And because they filmed this at night, it was going to be cold no matter what. But it actually happened to be the coldest day of the year that year in the original movie when they had Shaw jump into the river. And so maybe I don't I think that might be another like allusion to the original than bringing yeah, well, up the cold in the, in the water. Um, I also want to say we were talking about how this movie is more about um, bribes and lobbying uh, by political or by uh, corporations of political figures to sort of get their, uh, their foot in the door. Um, and I think it's also, which I, I like a lot. And I think it also touches on how poorly um, the U S government treats its uh, vets. Yeah. I, I was going to bring that up next. I'm glad you brought it oh. up. Yeah. I like that a lot. I don't really have anything else to say about it. I just like that the movie is commenting on it. Well, so there's like, there's a couple things where like, what I also like about this movie is there there are times in the movie where if you hadn't seen the original, if you didn't know anything about the original and this was you just saw the trailer for this movie and go like, oh, I'm going to go watch this movie, uh, where there are times where you could doubt whether or not there really is a plot because there are several times in the movie where they're like, dude, you've been uh, – Denzel, you've been on leave of absence a couple of times. Dude, we know you're not on your meds. Uh, 
kind of thing like that. So they 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 do paint him as an like he's not the narrator of the movie, but like they do paint him as an unreliable person. And then when you look at it from the perspective of other people, like the mom before we know she's in on it uh she says like dude he's been in and out of the va mental hospitals he's not on he just got reprimanded for not being on his meds he broke into another one of your units apartments and that guy ended up dead and we don't know where he is or what happened because jeffrey wright's character killed himself but the day that he killed himself denzel happened to be in the apartment so it's like for anybody else, it would look like Denzel is a stalker yeah. who is trying to kill him. So there, I, I like that aspect of, you know, maybe he, maybe this isn't real. Maybe these are just nightmares and everything. Like if I hadn't seen I, the original one watching this, you could think that for a little bit. I'd be interested in seeing um, what somebody who's not familiar with the original or hasn't had this one, you know, spoiled for them, if uh, how that works. Yeah. You know, if they think that, oh, maybe Denzel is, you know, crazy. Yeah, like I think it's you know like like the number twenty three with Jim Carrey or something like that. Like maybe Which this I person... still have not seen. It's it's I don't remember it at the time. I remember thinking this is all right, but uh, but yeah, that's pretty much all I got. I I think you, you said it at the top of this movie that uh, I think it was a worthy remake. I think we both said it that this was a good remake. It's not perfect, but it did enough different to go. It has ties to the original. It paid. It pays its respects to the original, but tries to do its own thing. Uh, I thought it was worth a watch. I don't think it was a bad movie. Yeah. No, I thought it was cool. Um, I, I think you're right, though, it. that they could do this again, though. Yeah, I'm trying to think of like what a you know an interesting director to do it again would be. I can't think of anybody off the top of my head. I, I, want, I, don't, I don't know if you would go someone obvious like David Fincher or if you go... I, I almost think like somebody unconventional who can also do like the political thriller and satire... Um, um, Danny Boyle comes to mind. Or, Danny Boyle um, would be good, uh, but I was actually thinking like uh, Taika Waititi. Like if he wanted to do something a little bit more serious, I think he could. I don't think he's at that point in his career. I think he could do it. Maybe with Jojo Rabbit, but yeah, I just don't. I think I think he wants like I don't know. If if he had already done another Thor movie, I think he'd be ready to do something straight drama. But I think he's still got a little bit of silliness left in him. He does, but I um, think. Uh, I, I, I would if he were gonna do something serious and they were like, We're doing this movie with Taika Waititi, I would be very intrigued. Um I'm I'm trying to remember the name of the director that I'm thinking of. Aronofsky. I think he'd be interesting. Yeah, I think he would be great too. It, big part of this movie is that it's about paranoia and how No, he would be fantastic. With. Um speaking of directors, by the way, the director of this movie is Jonathan Demi, who also did Sounds of the Lambs. Yep. I think that's a pretty good choice. Yeah, I think so. I, I thought this movie was I, I, especially I like Denzel going, in this too, by the way, since we're I, giving kudos. Yeah, Denzel was fantastic. I, th I think every performance in this was great. I thought Leif Shriver was great. Uh, Katrina yeah. actually watched part of the movie, like 10 minutes or so, and she's like, Leif Shriver has been like 40 for 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Just like Sinatra. Yeah. But, uh, oh, um, I another, little thing that I, another little thing that I wanted to point out, uh, his, his mother's maiden name is Prentice in this movie. Mm -hmm. Um. Which makes him apprentice. Ah, uh, that's clever. That's kind of cool. That is yeah. clever. I like the I trigger. Like we didn't even bring like up that. what the trigger is, but in this, it's literally saying his name, like his name, and then saying his name with the rank, and then planting the suggestion. So it's like you're less. It's very unlikely someone's going to phrase his name exactly like that. So it, it was like his name with his rank, then his name. And then his name with the like the apprentice Shaw and everything. Yeah. So it was essentially saying his name three times in a very specific way. It was the way to to get it to go. And I liked that you're not just gonna have somebody do that by accident, which happened in the original movie. Like somebody activated him by accident. Like having a deck of cards is absurd. Like what if this guy went to Vegas sometime? I know, right? Yeah. I like um you know, I like this idea of like a brainwashed sleeper cell. And I you know, MK Ultra is uh, a popular or a well-known thing. Yeah. Um, and I feel like there's there's room for a couple more of these types of movies. I think Jesse Eisenberg might have ruined it for our generation. Yeah. But I think it's an I interesting idea that, that hasn't been explored enough. Yeah. Is that a Max Landis movie? It is, right? I think so. Fuck that guy. <laughs> uh, but yeah, that's it. Uh, give give us your plugs, bud. Yeah, I'm on uh, I'm on Instagram. Uh, at Dysalexic, D-Y-S, Alex, I-C. 
I'm on the Twitters with the tweets, uh, at Polishi, just my last name, P-U-L-I-S-C-I. If you want to follow along with movies that I'm watching, I'm also on Letterboxd, at Polishi. And uh, I just got a TikTok. Uh-oh. Yeah. TikTok kinda... on the clock. Na, 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 na. Is that the theme oh, yeah, song for yeah. the oh. app? I have no it's idea. I doubt it. It's pretty silly, but I'm having fun on it. So if Good. you're a, if you're a talker, then come come follow me. It's at Polishi Polishi. Just my name twice. Nice. And uh, you guys can check out everything that's MDX Pods related at mdxpods.com, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all at MDX Pods. If you want to support this show, you can go to uh, patreon.com slash MDX Pods. We are ramping down on our fast franchise bonus episodes. So once we're through that franchise, uh, we're going to continue doing bonus episodes, but those will be transitioning to Patreon. Uh, we are going to start, we, we figured out what we're going to do, uh, but we are going to have weekly episodes, little mini episodes in between, uh, so you guys can know what we're going to be covering. And uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks for listening.